If the left hadn't been so racist, they could have considered that maybe Donald Trump had Canada in mind when he was talking about shitholes. Considering the new tax code, it would be a fair assessment. In other news, the grass tends to be green during summertime and Muslims tend to lie quite a lot for ideologically subversive reasons like any other totalitarian cult. Speaking of totalitarian cults, the Committee to Protect Journalists believe Donald Trump is the top global press oppressor. Yes, really. Oh yeah, and the traitor extraordinaire Bradley slash Chelsea Manning is running for Senate. <laughs> These are our stories on Periodic Insanity. Hello everyone and welcome to the 17th installment of Periodic Insanity. Alright, lots of insanity to cover, hence we're doing another episode of Periodic Insanity almost in a row. And I'm not sure this one will suffice, the 18th installment might also come in this batch of videos as well. We'll see. So, the first piece of insanity comes from Canada, which is getting deeper into the socialist hellhole category. You know those memes which used to be pushed by leftists where they would laud some socialist hellhole implying that those are doing something good or better and their conclusion was the, the opposite of what America does? Well, that's basically Canada now. Via Ottawa Sun, 92% of middle class families face tax hike over $2,200 beginning in 2019. The opposite of what America does! Now, it should be noted that it's about it's 2,200 $2, Canadian dollars, uh, so that's about $1,700, give or take, but still, it's not a trivial matter. Quote, a new Fraser Institute report, the effect of Canadian families of changes to federal income tax and CPP payroll tax, says more than 90% of Canadian families will pay higher taxes once the, Canadian, uh, the Canada Pension Plan taxes increases are fully implemented by 2025. The first of seven increases of CPP tax, which all workers must pay, begins in January 2019. The study's co-author, Charles Lamon, uh, talks about the impact on middle-class families. What was the most surprising thing you found in the report? Canadian families will endure a significant tax increase and that tax bill will increase over time. The Trudeau government has talked about cutting taxes for families based on the personal income tax changes they've already put in the case. Uh, we found that's simply not true for the vast majority of middle class families. But then, the, but then there are major uh, tax changes set to come into effect starting next year, particularly the payroll tax hike to fund the, pan the Canada Pension Plan expansion. We found that plus uh, uh, what has already been impl implemented will result in over 92% of all families with children in Canada paying higher taxes and they'll be paying an average of $2,200 more per year. Why is this significant? The Trudeau government has repeatedly claimed to cut taxes on the vast majority of families and our findings show that's not the case. The reason why the Trudeau government is claiming they cut taxes is because they're focusing on just one of the many changes they've either enacted themselves or spearheaded as a government. The focus has been on the federal rate cut from 22% to 20.5%. However, the reality is they've introduced several other tax changes, both on the personal income tax system and they've spearheaded with the province's CPP, which will result in higher payroll taxes. What does $2,200 tax hike mean in context uh, for 92% of families in Canada? It could be a mortgage payment for a family, it could be childcare or grocery bills. We're not talking about a trivial amount here. It's a significant increase in the tax bill, no doubt. When we look at the middle class, they're actually more hard hit than the overall average. Which is ironic because that is the group of families that the Trudeau government has said they want to help. In fact, what will happen in practice, there will be basically no tax decrease for anybody since once the CPP tax changes are in full effect. Close quote. 
Now, isn't it lovely? Now, I have seen some leftists uh, going butthurt over this report, claiming that the CPP is not a tax. Like hell it isn't! And this is how leftists in all countries have managed to hide the extent to which the governments are stealing from us regular people. Now, I'm not a Canadian, thank God, but the same stunt is being pulled here in Europe by almost every single government in every European country, with the possible exception of Liechtenstein and maybe Malta. Some of the taxes are simply renamed as contributions or social contributions, or in the case of the United States, social security. It is still the same crap, folks. If you take money from me by force with the purpose of redistribution, that is a tax. There's no way you can work around that. An argument pushed, uh, another argument pushed by the fans of this thing is that it's not a tax because it is automatically retained before you even get to see your wage and such contributions are also required from the employer, as if that means something. Well, that, my fellow deplorables, is simply more obfuscation. At best, you can say it is a tax also on employers. But even that is misleading, because just like the experience in Europe shows, it's only an accountant's fiction. When I want to employ someone, what I ask my accountant is how much will it cost? Not how much the CPP, or the case in Europe, uh, the social contributions will be. Nobody really asks that. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to employ someone and I agree uh, with that someone on a salary of 1,078 euros a month, or 5,000 Romanian lei. The next step is I go to my company accountant and ask him, how much will it cost me to give this person legally 1,078 euros a month? <clears throat> because the answer is not 1,078 euros. For instance, in the case of Romania, the answer is 1,884 euros and 86 cents. And that is the complete salary. Now, the accountant will write in the papers that uh, he'll file with the tax authority that 41 euros of that is the employer's contribution. But that, as I said, is a fiction for the accountant. In practice, it means that I will expect my employee to generate at least 2,000 euros of value per month for my company so as to be worth it for me as an employer to pay him 1,000 euros per month. The same is true in Canada, except they have slightly different names for the reasons the government steals from employees, as, and the rates are usually slightly higher, but the procedure is absolutely identical. As you can see on the screen in my Romanian example, the state takes 25% for CAS, which is shorthand for contributions for social insurance, pretty much like in the US, 10% for health insurance, and 559 lei, which is 16%, the actual flat income tax rate. Using this scheme, the Romanian government can claim it has among the lowest taxes in the European Union because, look, there's just the 16% flat tax. Which is true, if you're running a sole proprietor or you're doing any kind of work that is not salaried work. Similarly, the Canadian government claims it has lowered taxes because it changed the federal tax rate from 22% to 20%-ish, <clears throat> which again, is true only if you're working in such a way that that's the only tax you're paying, which is much more difficult to accomplish uh, than it is in Romania or anywhere else in Europe. But in both examples, the governments are being utterly disingenuous because the vast majority of the population lives from a form of salaried work, i.e. it relies on a paycheck that is subjected to all of the other taxes as well. So the Fraser Institute is absolutely correct to point out that when it all is said and done, the average person will be hit with a de facto tax increase, because at the end of the day, it makes no difference for the individual being taxed on whether the tax is called a tax or the Canadian pension plan. Now, some will say, well, yeah, but you see, you do benefit uh, from the pension. Well, are you sure about that? Because at the end of the day, all of the state pension schemes, including the American so Social Security Scheme, and to say nothing about the failed European pension schemes, all of these are bankrupt over the long run. This whole thing will collapse unless it will be reformed, and I wouldn't hold my breath on the reform thing because nobody wants to touch these. So collapse will it be. It's only a question of when and to a lesser extent how. 
In addition to that, there's also the question of morality. No matter how you look at this, such a scheme is immoral especially the European model, which is also in place in Canada, because at the end of the day, the money is being redistributed instead of being invested, and all traces of individual contribution are erased. And well, what I mean by that is that if you die before you reach the age of retirement, you cannot designate who to receive the shekels you are entitled to for which you have already made contributions. Instead, the money is lost forever on you and redistributed to others. Now you may say this is acceptable, which is a legitimate position to hold, uh, to hold, albeit economically illiterate and fundamentally immoral, but if you deem that acceptable, then you cannot say this whole pension plan thing is anything but a tax with redistributive uh, characteristics, otherwise known as socialism. Now, I'm sorry for the longish explanation, but it's getting really frustrating to be given arguments that are rooted in nothing but feelings and a chronic lack of information. So yeah, when all the facts are put on the table, the Trudeau administration is essentially pure insanity, not just in social terms, but in economic terms as well. Also, let's not forget that the Fraser Institute is only looking at direct taxes, but that's not, not the whole extent of the fiscal burden. The fiscal burden is the entirety of shekels that the government takes from you, so that means all of the VAT, VAT, various vice taxes, indirect taxes, and so on and so forth. And considering that the Trudeau administration has also increased taxes on gas and other primary necessities, the total fiscal burden of the average Canadian will go much higher than just 2200 Canadian dollars. Socialism is cancer. It's really that simple. Trudeau would rather have the poor poorer, provided that the rich are less rich. All right, enough with this. Let's go to another piece of Canadian insanity. Via CTV News, Caesar's attack on girl in hijab did not happen, police says. Toronto police say an incident involving an 11-year-old girl who claimed to have uh, her hijab cut by a stranger on the street did not happen. On Friday, Toronto police said they were investigating on a report that a young girl was attacked by a man with scissors as she was walking to school in the east end of the city. According to officers at the time, the 11-year-old girl was on her way to Pauline Johnson Public School in Scarborough, where she felt something that, and turned around to see a man trying to cut her hijab with a pair of scissors. She said she screamed and ran away, but the man returned less than 10 minutes later and tried to cut it once again. In speaking with CTV News on Monday, Toronto Police Service spokesperson Mark Pugash said investigators reached the conclusion after sifting through the evidence. Quote, we had, as everyone knows, allegations of an extremely serious crime on Friday, no, it's not serious, which we investigated. We had a team of investigators put together a significant amount of evidence and they came to the conclusion that the events that were alleged did not happen, Pugash said. We have spoken with the girl, we have spoken to all the people in the, the public would expect us to speak to in the course of a thorough investigation, and when we put all of that together, we look at it very closely, and that was the conclusion that we came to close. Quote. Now, in a normal world, the parents of this girl would be indicted. But it's Canada, so nothing will happen. In fact, the far left is telling everyone that the, it is the liar who deserves an apology. Yes, really. But the reason I include this case is a bit broader, because this lying girl is part of a pattern, a pattern of lies, damn lies and abuse by Islam against normal people. Because let's be honest here, the parents coached the girl into lying for an ulterior motive. This is not the case of, oh, the girl was scared and whatnot. In fact, if you look at the testimony, it sure does come as rehearsed. And that's because it was. Islam is a totalitarian movement first and foremost. Uh, Jamie Glazo from Front Page Magazine explains this very well, so I will read from his expose. And I will remove specific references from the cases Glazo is citing precisely to show that his analysis is spot on because it applies essentially to all the so called hate crime cases. So, quote, to gain power, totalitarian movements always portray themselves as victims, and while they are in the process of abusing, they cry in front of the world posing as the abused. They stage hate crime attacks against themselves because hate crimes are their political and cultural capital. When those hate crimes don't exist, 
they must be invented. We are witnessing precisely this phenomenon at this very moment in regards to the myriad of hoax hate crimes that anti-Trump forces are manufacturing out of thin air and blaming it on Trump supporters. The media are bolstering the entire hallucination process with CNN leading the way. Central to the whole narrative is the supposed Islamophobic anti-Muslim crime wave sweeping the nation. The rumors spread and the media regurgitates the lies without any evidence to back them up. And then after the hoaxes are debunked one by one, the media is, by that time, bored and no longer interested. The latest Islamophobia counterfeit involves a Muslim student at a university. The Muslimah alleged allege that her hijab and wallet were stolen by two individuals who were shouting racial slurs. The woman's accusation incensed, uh, incensed leftists and Muslims across the nation and the world, prompting the ACLU to issue a statement denouncing both the incident and, of course, Donald Trump. The investigation into the incident involved several law enforcement agencies. The Washington Post, the New York Times, a former newspaper, and CNN, meanwhile, and ate the story up. But what happened to this Muslimah's story under tough police questioning? Well, the incident, the student eventually broke down and admitted to police that she had fabricated the entire thing. By that time, of course, the media wasn't too interested in such an innocuous little detail. Recently, the Huffington Post reported on an incident of Islamophobia under the headline Islamophobia just drove this boy and his family out of America. It was all so heartbreaking and unjust. The one little problem with the story, however, was that it never happened. Trump supporters, meanwhile, are supposedly involved in a lot of other evil than just attacking Muslim women on campuses and driving little Muslim boys out of America. A gay Canadian filmmaker, Chris Ball, was alleged to have been beaten up by Trump supporters on election night in Santa Monica. It was upsetting, but it turned out the incident never really happened at all. All of these hate crime fabrications made up by the anti-Trump forces are nothing new. They are a completely natural ingredient of how totalitarians operate and hence how the unholy alliance of the left and Islam operates. Shilman fellow Daniel Greenfield explains this phenomenon in the context of the left. The left is a victimhood cult. It feeds off pain and fetishizes suffering as a moral commodity to be sold and resold in exchange for political power. Greenfield calls this leftist charade victimocracy and, labels it, uh, and labels it its foot soldier the cry bully who is in reality the abuser victim. The monster, Greenfield writes, is the abuser who pretends to be a victim. His arguments are his feelings. He comes armored in identity politics entitlement and is always yelling about social justice or crying social justice tears. If you don't fight back, the cry bully bullies you. If you fight back, the cry bully cries and demands a safe space because you made him feel unsafe. Thus, uh, because now the unholy alliance maniacs feel unsafe because they didn't get their way in the election, it becomes very clear why it's crucial for them to play the victim and, most importantly, to fabricate hate crimes being perpetrated against themselves. Greenfield explains, if cry bullies can't safe bait you, they will manufacture threats by faking hate crimes against themselves or phoning in bomb threats to validate their need for a safe space in which no one is allowed to disagree with them. Surviving their own fake, uh, fake crimes turns cry bullies into social justice heroes. Islamic supremacists play a key part in this story, and since the left controls our culture and boundaries of discourse, it makes complete sense that the media, instead of focusing on how the Muslim community should make Americans feel safe by repudiating Islamic texts that inspire and sanction violence against unbelievers, instead amplify the narrative that it is the Muslims who are afraid and that it is the non-Muslim people who make Muslims feel safe. Leading scholar of Islam, Robert Spencer, explains this charade, unveiling why Muslim Brotherhood front groups, uh, and such as the Kair, or in this case the National Council of Canadian Muslims, need there to be hate crimes against Muslims so badly. These councils want uh, and need hate crimes against Muslims because they're the currency they use to buy power and influence in our victimhood-oriented society and to deflect attention away from jihad terror and onto Muslims as putative victims. This is why the Muslimah fabricated the hate crime against herself. It is also why her lie is only the latest example in a long list of so many other Muslim counterfeit stories. Any questions? 
because really this is what's at play here. The National Council of uh, Canadian Muslims ate the story hook, line and sinker and issued statements of condemnations. Yeah, they are But now, when the story turned out to be a lie, the same council is nowhere to be seen. Don't fall for the Muslim narrative. In fact, considering what everyone should know about Takia by now, you should automatically presume that the Muslim is lying in these cases. Because so far, in the last two years, literally 100% of the cases of the so-called hate crimes against Muslims turned out to be at least in part fake, usually entirely manufactured. Also, let's not forget that there is no such thing as a hate crime outside of rich imagination of leftists and other appeasers of the totalitarian cult that Islam is. No, someone reminding you that Muhammad was a pedophile is not a hate crime. No, someone telling you that the hijab is not appropriate is not a hate crime. Deal with it. Or, you know, you could go back to wherever the hell you came from. It's no obligation to live in the West, you know. There's plenty of room in Saudi Arabia. Okay, now since we mentioned Donald Trump in passing, let's put this uh, lunacy in this episode as well. Uh, coming from the Hill, Trump named top global press oppressor. The Committee to Protect Journalists named President Trump as the winner of its overall achievement in undermining Global Press Freedom Award in its Press Oppressors Awards on Monday. The committee released a list of top global press oppressors on Monday in response to Trump's upcoming fake news awards, giving Trump the top honor. While previous US presidents have each criticized the press to some degree, they have also made public commitments to uphold its essential role in democracy at home and abroad, the committee wrote. Trump, by contrast, has consistently undermined domestic news outlets and declined um, to publicly raise freedom of the press with repressive leaders such as Xi Jinping, Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Trump was also named the runner-up in the most thin-skinned category, losing a top spot to Turkish President Erdogan. He re regularly attacks outlets and individuals, uh, individual journalists on Twitter and in speeches calling them sad, failing or garbage, the committee wrote of Trump. Since declaring his presidential candidacy in 2015, Trump has posted about 1,000 tweets critical of the press. Erdogan also won for most outrageous use of terror laws against the press, and Chinese President Xi Jinping got the top, stop for, top, top spot for tightest grip on media, close quote. And this is why I don't trust any of these organizations. Now, if you remember, back in February 2017, I made a video about the country ranking by press freedom um, report you should, issued by... Uh, uh, reporters Without Borders or Reporters Sans Frontières. This kind of over-the-top lunacy is endemic in these organizations, allegedly constructed to defend journalism. Uh, reporters Without Borders, for instance, thinks the German uh, and the Swedish press is freer than the American press because reasons. Even while the German state conducts routine crackdowns on independent journalists and free speech is a completely alien notion in Germany, and has always been since there's not a single moment in German history when free speech was a thing. Not since unification, anyway. <laughs> and the same is true with this uh, Committee to Protect Journalists which seems much more concerned to protect journalists from hurt feelings because the president called out their bullcrap on Twitter rather than protecting journalists from, I don't know, maybe imprisonment, for instance. Their most recent report on, in, on Kazakhstan is from 2016, even as the repression of the press has increased. They barely uh, cover Azerbaijan, which is a place with no freedom of the press to speak of. Yet somehow Trump is the global oppressor of the world. This is plain and simple insanity. There's just no way to describe this. All right, let's speak about the Danny state a little bit and then go to the mandatory transgender politics segment of these episodes. So on the topic of the Danny state via the Telegraph, Theresa May appoints Minister for Loneliness after Joe Cox Commission highlight Britain's epidemic. <laughs> I mean, I thought this was a satire at first, but no, it's a very long and very serious article in which it is being explained to us why the state, why the state needs to have an opinion on this. <laughs> Amazing. Quote, 
Theresa May has appointed a Minister for Loneliness as part of the legacy of the murdered Labour MP Joe Cox. Tracy Crouch, the Minister for Sport and Civil Society, will fill the newly created role for Ministerial Lead on Loneliness to head up the government's work to tackle a problem that is believed to affect 9 million people in the United Kingdom. Ahead of a Downing Street reception today to celebrate the life and legacy of Mrs. Cox, Mrs. May said she was keen to shine a light on the issue of loneliness. The Joe Cox Loneliness Commission, set up to tackle one of the issues the late MP cared most passionately about, recommended that the government make a minister responsible for a national strategy to combat loneliness. Mrs. May said, far too many people lonely, for far too many people, loneliness is the sad reality of modern life. I want to confront this challenge for our society and for all of us to take action to address the loneliness endured by the elderly, by carers, by those who have lost loved ones, people who have no one to talk to or share their thoughts and experiences with. Joe Cox recognized the scale of loneliness across the country and dedicated herself to doing all she could uh, to help those affected. I am pleased that government can build on her legacy with a ministerial lead for loneliness who will work with the Commission, business and charities to shine a light on the issue and pull together all strands of government to create the first ever strategy. Research by the British Red Cross and the, the Cooperative uh, revealed that more than 9 million adults in the UK feel lonely. The government will publish a cross-government strategy on loneliness in England later this year and has begun work on establishing a fund to encourage innovative and community-based solutions for the issue. Tracy Crouch, the Minister for Loneliness, <laughs> said, I am privileged to be taking forward the remarkable work done by Joe Cox, the Foundation and the Commission. I'm sure that with the support of volunteers, campaigners, businesses and my fellow MPs from all sides of the House, we can make significant progress in defeating loneliness. <laughs> <sighs> Jesus Christ. I mean, what's next? The Minister for Masturbation? I mean, why not? If the nanny state is to try to tackle loneliness, then maybe they should tackle masturbation too. After all, we all know that women masturbate less than men, and as a result, they lose out, out on the awesomeness. So maybe the government should step in. And we can't let this terrible inequality stand, can't we? Also, maybe the Minister for Loneliness will soon be in charge of allotting a mate. Why not? It would fix loneliness for many. Just think of how many lonely men, especially young men, are out there, to say nothing about the lonely single mothers or the lonely mostly old female feminists. Government allotted girlfriends and boyfriends. Why not? I could definitely see that being seriously proposed in about a decade or so in the United Kingdom, especially in the United Kingdom, not so much everywhere else, well, maybe Canada or Finland, but that's up for debate. The UK, however, has been on a consistent path for about 25 years to become literally the Airstrip 1. So I wouldn't put it past, past the uh, British nanny state, or at the very least the British nanny state ideologues, to try to propose this. Terrible! Don't try this at home, kids! Alright, <laughs> let's move on and get closer to transgender politics. Uh, coming from the mirror, lesbian mom who viciously beat bride walks free after telling court she has high levels of male hormones. <laughs> Quote, a lesbian mother who subjected her bride to a vicious beating uh, has walked free after telling a court she has a medical condition which leaves sufferers with high levels of male hormones. Luan Budgen, 33, had a petulant meltdown at wife of 18 months, Haley, for leaving a Christmas family gathering early at 9 p.m. so she could put their three children to bed. Three hours after Haley left her at the bash, Budgen turned up uh, drunk at the couple's marital home in Red Radcliffe, Greater Manchester, asked for money to pay a taxi and then dragged the victim from their bed by the hair. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> it's not like lesbian relationships are, by a very far margin, the most violent relationships that can exist or anything. I mean, come on. Not to mention the level of nastiness. I mean, drag her by the hair from inside the house to the alley where the taxi was stationed? Terrible! But I tell you what, in the current year, we are supposed to accept and believe anyone who says is the opposite sex, 
even if they don't do anything to at least present like the opposite sex. So if this individual has male hormones, then that's a lot more than many trans men have. So as a result, we can declare her a man. And as such, she should get the judicial treatment a man in her situation would have gotten, which is jail, not walking scot-free. And in a male jail, preferably. I mean, why not? You're not against gender affirmative society, aren't you? You're not a bigot or something, aren't you? Give this man what he deserves! <laughs> On a more serious note, though, this is something that will not change unless some serious introspection will happen. And it's not just the issue of women getting away with horrible crimes solely, solely because they're women, whereas men cannot even begin to dream about getting away with the exact same crime. That's just one aspect. There are also others, such as the systemic negative consequences of gay marriage. Now, nobody wants to talk about this, this, not even conservatives, but the fact of the matter is that gay marriage means protecting the most violent relationships existing on the face of this planet, that is, lesbian relationships. And not just protecting them, but forcing children to live under such horrible arrangements. One of the um, conversation-ending pseudo-arguments of the religious left when it comes to this is the rhetorical question that, oh, you wouldn't want children to live in foster cares or orphanages, would you? Well, quite frankly, the answer should be yes. Because no matter how you look at it, a child is far safer from physical violence and traumatic events, such as witnessing domestic violence, in both orphanages and foster care with straight foster parents, than he is in a lesbian family. Yes, orphanages are terrible and rife with abuse, but lesbian families are far worse than that. Nobody wants to say this in public, even though it is entirely true. Ask an, an LGBT East organization what is their policy on lesbian domestic violence and you'll be called a misogynist in no time. Because you see, talking about women's systemic violence is haram even amongst those who purport to lecture us about breaking the norms and breaking the gender stereotypes and all the rest. It's all ball crap. When push comes to shove, these people are far worse than all of those traditionalists that they have replaced. All right, so the last segment is about the notorious traitor Chelsea Manning. He's running for Senate. <laughs> No, seriously, I'm not joking. <laughs> Let's watch his first campaign ad. I'm Chelsea Manning, and I approve this message. We live in trying times. Times of fear. Of suppression. Of hate. We don't need more, or better, leaders. We need someone willing to fight. We need to stop asking them to give us our rights. They won't support us. They won't compromise. We need to stop expecting that our systems will somehow fix themselves. We need to actually take the reins of power from them. We need to challenge them at every level. We need to fix this. We don't need them anymore. We can do better. You're damn right we got this. Now, <laughs> I first thought this is a joke, but it isn't. This guy is serious. Now, if you're asking how can he run, well, the answer is pretty simple. Maryland passed a law last year allowing felons to hold office. Also, Maryland is already represented in the Senate by a senator who seriously believes that all felons should be allowed to vote. How oh, isn't that lovely? And the whole reason this candidacy is not laughed off the stage is because Manning is a dude who thinks he's a woman. That's it. That's the sole reason. So at least we now know where the priorities of the Democratic Party lie. Because if Manning hadn't said he's a woman, he would have never been tolerated to begin with. 
Just think about it for a second. This guy utterly embarrassed both the Bush and the Obama administration and placed numerous US government assets at risk. Or, in plain language, a lot of innocent people were placed in a situation where they could have been killed simply because this dude decided to send classified material to third parties. Further on, the Obama administration got even more bad press because of the treatment Obama's administration applied to this guy while in pre-trial. Even I agree that some of that constitutes cruel and unusual punishment, and some of it wasn't even punishment per se, as he had not yet been found guilty at the time. So, he is a guy who uh, was a pain in the ass for the Democratic administration and also jeopardized national security in a clear and tangible way, a theme of which Democrats at least profess to be interested about, uh, though apparently not so much if it can be used to attack President Trump. Under normal circumstances, he would not be embraced by the Democrats. But because he is a dude who insists he is a woman, suddenly everything changes. And by everything, I mean everything. Suddenly, Manning is everywhere. In The Guardian in particular, which is a good evidence of where his biggest friends live. And it's not in the United States and definitely not in Maryland. But he wants to represent the people of Maryland. Now, of course, you could say that he'll never make it to the nomination, let alone the Senate, and that is indeed a sensible position to take. But the way the cultural institutions are treating him and his candidacy are a good reflection on how Democrat politics will look like not so long from now. Remember, politics is downstream from culture, is an adage that applies to the left as much as it applies to the right. Heck, a chap from the Daily Caller was suspended from Twitter for the horrible speech crime of tweeting emojis at Manning. <laughs> he tweeted a pair of scissors, two nuts and a clown at Manning. <laughs> Twitter thought that's worthy of a suspension, because heaven forbid someone tweets some nuts, we can't have that. <laughs> With that said, steps to torpedo his campaign have already been taken. It's amazing how easy you can arrange some photo ops, especially when your target is gullible, easily, tar easily triggered leftists. <laughs> so, on January the 21st, I think, he was invited to a Night for Freedom, an event organized by Mike Tsernovich, and uh, he showed up. <laughs> no, seriously, he did! <laughs> now, the reason I laugh about this is because the left is terrified by this, and repudiations have abounded from the grassroots millennial SGW types. With that said, The Guardian, Mike.com and other uh, far-left outlets have been quick to run defenses of, of him, which, again, is a good sign on how the, uh, the politics of the Democrat Party will look like in a few years. Sure, Manning might not even get the, the nomination, but the process of fundamentally transforming the Democrat Party into an even more international socialist institution has already been set in motion. And that, in itself, is relevant. Now, I don't know whether the invitation of Bradley Manning and the photos were a purposeful attempt to derail his campaign or not, but I do know that the reaction by the grassroots left is proving the point I've been trying to make for almost a year now since I've been doing the practical politics videos. The point being that polarization needs to be embraced and not shunned. One of the most consistent critiques to my approaches, and this is the final point and then we wrap this up, one of the most consistent critiques presented is that my methods promote division and polarization. Well, are you sure about that? First of all, even if it had been true, that's not something wrong per se. Thank God there weren't too many of these people back in the 80s when division from communism was the main theme for any individual with an IQ higher than a chimpanzee. Secondly, it is the left which consistently says that even a polite conversation with the people you disagree with makes you a racist or a fascist or whatever. I talk to leftists all the time, and on the Romanian language channel I covered leftist events without editorializing. And a lot more of that is coming, by the way. And if I get the chance to attend a leftist event even while I'm visiting another country, I will go there. Heck, I covered the leftist event while in Sweden, from the Green Party no less, which I consider them to be the loony asylum. 
So regardless of the background of Manning's presence at the Tsenovich's gala, it is pretty obvious to me who are the purveyors of division and polarization, if we're judging by actions, of course. Tsenovich says, and I quote, anyone is welcome to party with me. And then he lives up to that by letting Manning in. Gavin McInnes, who believes trannies are gender niggers, and that's a direct quote, had no problem chatting with Manning. Most of the people there believed uh, like I do, and like the Canadian government does, namely that Manning is a traitor, and that he's mentally unstable. But even so, none of them harassed him or gave him a bad time. It was the left, and only the left, that lashed out against Manning for his audacity to show up to an event. How dare he go speak with some people? We can't have that. Oh no, Stefan Molyneux spoke at that event. Terrible! Anyway, we will be following Manning's campaign and while I don't think he will win, I do hope he'll get the nomination because I do want a Republican to win in Maryland. Preferably, preferably a Trumpian Republican to help make America great again. <laughs> and with all of that being said, that's it for this episode of Periodic Insanity. A lot more of this is coming, especially as I'll be around for the next month and basically until Easter. I only have two short business trips and the rest of it is time for the channel. After the Orthodox Easter, things will get complicated, but more on that when the time comes. So with uh, that, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your consistent and generous support. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Please do subscribe to my social media and um, I'll see you all very soon on Freedom Alternative.